Uh, we should just touch on the primaries that took place uh, this past week. Uh, Don Blankenship uh, will not be the uh, Republican nominee from West Virginia. There were two big themes, though, uh, that came out of uh, this week, I would say. One is, is that um, there are a lot of female Democratic candidates. I think 20 were up for uh, running in these primaries. I think about 17 won. This is off the back, off the top of my head. So forgive me if I'm off by one or two. Um, very uh, encouraging. Obviously uh, not enough, but it's uh, it's encouraging, A. And B, also indicative of what we've seen in terms of increased activism by by women in the wake of the Donald Trump election. The other uh, thing that stuck out for me was the failure of Republican Congress people to win. In some instances, uh, they ran uh, for Senate um, a nomination. In some instances, there was a uh, there was one in North Carolina who was an incumbent who lost. And in that same race, the Democrat uh, it, running unopposed uh, had still an extra 10, 15,000 votes. So there's still a lot of indication out there that uh, the Republicans are in trouble. Uh, the Democrats have a huge advantage. Uh, they also have a huge advantage in terms of like wins per dollar, essentially. Um, there's still some evidence that the Democrats need to be a little bit more specific and articulate with their agenda. A, a poll that came out from CBS this week but broadly speaking, um, there is no reason to believe that the narrative that the Republicans are going to be in trouble in the fall, at least in the House, um, has in any way changed. No, uh, so far so good. I mean, I think, you know, we've, we've seen throughout, uh, you know, since 2016, the special elections have all uh, certainly trended toward Democrats, you know, mostly won by Democrats. And now we're seeing these primaries and starting to see how this is going to shape up how the Republicans are are handling their own party. I mean, I think what you say about the Democrats is true, that there are a lot of women running and a lot of women winning, which I think is great news and, and indicative, as you say, of the, uh, you know, reaction, I think, against Trumpism. And I don't think anybody should underrate that as a, as a phenomenon. It's huge. And it is meaningful as far as, um, you know, activism and motivation and, you know, getting people involved in politics. I think it's been very, very big. But the Republican side is interesting because I think people thought that maybe Trumpism would be, um, you know, that it would be would be manifested in somebody like Don Blankenship, you know, the way it was with Roy Moore down in down in Alabama. And that didn't happen. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that. I mean, number one, of course, I mean, he was responsible for the death of 29 West yeah. Virginians. So, you know, a few people there actually thought that was kind of a big deal and maybe he shouldn't be rewarded. But, you know, the Democrats were also very strategic. There were three guys running and they went in and put a lot of effort into um, going against the, the one guy who might have been able to get Democratic votes. Uh, from Joe Manchin in the general right. election. And and so they did some strategic stuff that I was actually fairly impressed with because, you know, they rarely do that very well. Um, but there's another thing Ron Brownstein brought up when he's looking around at all the races where the Republicans won, and it seems like the more mainstream won. But they the more mainstream now is extremely anti-immigrant. It is, as Trump is, Trump has completely consumed the Republican Party with anti-immigrant fervor. And even the most mainstream of the candidates were running on that platform. And when you look towards the fall, I think that's going to be a meaningful thing because the, the, these policies that these people are promoting of mass deportations and, you know, building the wall and all of this, you know, the Muslim ban and everything, um, it's not, they're not popular. That isn't a popular... <laughs> <laughs> that is, it's only popular with this very hardcore Trump base. And everybody and I would, else, you know, including a lot of Republicans, aren't for it. Let me push back a little bit on the idea that this is just a, this is a Trump phenomena. Because, well, you're right about that, yeah. Because, I mean, I, I remember in 2005 where the Bush administration was actually trying desperately, uh, sort of realizing that the future of the Republican Party was in peril if it, uh, if it did not... 
um, sort of expand uh, its 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 definition of who Americans were in some respect, right? Like you know, it, uh, from beyond the white, and um, there was uh, you know an attempt by the Bush administration to promote uh, comprehensive immigration reform, and it got stymied big time. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, to a certain extent, that was an untold story uh, because, you know, you don't necessarily see when you have a rather conservative uh, president, you don't necessarily see when the, the conservatives actually sink a a proposal. But I have a feeling like that 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 weakened uh, George Bush more than I think was reported contemporaneously. I you think, know, I think uh, you're right about that. It's it's wrong to assume that this was, you know, that Trump, for, for me to have said that Trump has consumed the Republican Party. Trump basically just sort of came out and represented this wing of the party that he was is already a mirror. in existence. He's the mirror, yes, exactly. He was a, a mirror to a to a, uh, conti- a constituency that, that was always there. It just it wasn't necessarily catered to in the same way. They were well, maybe and slightly... the elites tried to tamp it down. Remember, I mean, they were always, yep. you know, the George Bush and the the other leaders of the party kind of, sh- you know, ixnay on the, you know, anti-immigrant mm-hmm. way. I mean, they they were not wanting that because they knew. I mean, they can count, and they knew that yep. was going to be a problem. And one of the things that Brownstein points out in his piece is that people were, you know, it's one thing when they're running in these sort of very heavily white working, you know, non-college educated. Um, constituency where there aren't a lot of immigrants. That's where the real fervor is, because people who don't live around immigrants, you know, people like you and I do, or we live in big cities, and, you know, I, immigrants are just, I don't even think about it, right? It's just right. totally normal. But for people who live in places where there hasn't been a lot of immigration, this is very, you know, this is a really salient issue for them. But these Republicans aren't aren't just from those areas. These Republicans, you know, allegedly mainstream, you know, sort of Republicans who aren't Don Blankenship, um, they're running on that platform in places where there are a lot of college-educated white people, a lot of immigrants, a lot of, you know, it, there's going to be some some consequences for sure. them taking that taking that uh, position. And yet, in the Republican Party, I think they've just decided across the board that they have to do this. I mean, this is where they are. And I think it's become much more obvious, much more open. And uh, that's going to be a battleground, I think, on which this upcoming election is going to be fought in a way that I think maybe we hadn't, at least I hadn't thought of it before. I hadn't seen it as being one. I mean, obviously, you know. Well, they're going to, listen, they're going to try. They're gonna, they're throwing everything against the, the kitchen wall because uh, nothing uh, nothing seems to be sticking. And I should, I should just add, too, people should keep it in mind, we've seen these special elections. Remember, the reason why there were special elections there was because most of those people were appointed to the Trump administration. So uh, the the idea that, you know, that those theoretically should be districts where Democrats do the worst and uh, where you would get the most extreme messaging from the Republicans. But look, Digby, we've got to take a break. When we come back, let's talk about Michael Cohen and his uh, pay to play shop that seems to be, um, you know, built on the on the White House lawn. We'll be uh, right back. I'm Sam Cedar. We're talking to the great Digby on Ring of Fire Radio.